Welcome to Worship. I'm Randy. And I'm Terrell Henderson. We were looking for a church family when we moved to Wichita eight years ago. And we came to visit Chapel Hill and everyone in the church welcomed us with open arms and we had felt very welcome and loved by everyone. Welcome to worship. Good morning and welcome to online worship here at Chapel Hill. We're so thankful that you've joined us on this Chief Sunday. We are gathering to pray for the Kansas City Chiefs. And if you're not a Chiefs fan, do I feel sorry for you? I'm sorry. I'm being silly. We are God's people, whether we're Chiefs fans or not. But we can also pray for them. <laughs> so... Thank you, Randy and Terrell, for leading us in our welcome today. We're so thankful for the gift of your lives and for you being a part of this congregation. I have a, just a few brief announcements today. First of all, Chapel Hill 101 is this afternoon at 2 p.m. This is for those who want to know more about our mission and explore membership. And then Ash Wednesday is the 17th of February. All of the information about Ash Wednesday is at our website, chwichita.org. And this week, I got to talk to the Reverend Dr. James Brian Smith. He's doing really well with his sabbatical and the writing of his book. He appreciates our prayers. So as we continue to worship today, would you join me as we sing praise to the Lord? You are my strength. Strength like no other Strength like no other Reaches to me You are my hope Hope like no other Hope like join me in prayer. Let's pray. Oh God, our strength, our help, our hope, we come to you in thanksgiving and praise. You are so good to us. Your faithfulness endures for all generations. Thank you that you are always ready to hear us, to receive us, to hold us. Thank you that you meet us here in many different places, and you welcome us to come just as we are. Help us to learn from Jesus, to follow after his example, and to steal away in silence and solitude to be alone with you. 
Help us to find our footing once more upon Christ, the solid rock. Oh God, we pray for those among us who need a special touch from you today. We, we name Jeff Hoig and Colton Hurt, Todd St. Louis, Grant Pierce, and their families. And we pray for all those who struggle in illness and in pain. We name Sheila and Bob Martin and their family in their time of sorrow and all who are facing loss and painful goodbyes. We pray for those who are struggling with loneliness or fear and we ask that you work through us to bless others. Oh God, we commit this worship service. We commit our very lives to your will and your service. And we love you and we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. The Gospel reading is according to the evangelist Mark. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around at the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth, may the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, because you and you alone are our strength and our redeemer. 
Amen. Our family has a neighbor who moved out of our neighborhood in Bel Air, and every once in a while she comes back to visit us, and we gather around the kitchen table and we play catch up. And the other day we were having our catch up conversation, and all of a sudden Mrs. Witten says, Now, Jeff, keep it 100. I said, What? She said, keep it 100. I said, what does that mean, Mrs. Witten? She said, that means you keep it real. That means you give it all you've got. That means you're all in. That means that you go all out. It means that you be all there. Don't you know what that means? I said, no, I, I confess I've never heard that phrase before. She says, well, you've probably heard it, but you didn't know what it meant. I said, that's right. I don't know what it means to keep 100. Now you do, she said. Use that phrase, keep 100. All the young people know that phrase. <laughs> I was thinking of Mrs. Witten when Devontae Adams, one of the best NFL wide receivers who plays for the Green Bay Packers, was interviewed before their loss to Tampa Bay. And it was a great interview because he talked about how obsessed he is with his craft. And he named routes that he thinks through all day long and sometimes all night long and different plays that he goes through in his mind and different speeds that he needs to run, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a fascinating interview. At the end of the interview, the interviewer said, in light of how you work, you just think about your craft all the time. You remind me of the Sushi King. He said, to Devante, have you seen the documentary that came out in 2012 on the Sushi King, Jiro? He said, well, as a matter of fact, I have. And the interviewer said, you two are so similar in that you're all in. You're 100% committed. You're so devoted to your trade, to your craft. Maybe you've seen that documentary when I was thinking about Mrs. Witten and Devante and the interview, it took me to the Gospel of Mark, which we're looking at in this entire year. And last Sunday, we started in chapter 1, we're going to be in chapter 1 for a bit yet, where Jesus, his very first day, his first day on the job, Mark wants us to know that the Gospel begins with Jesus and his public ministry, and he's preaching in the synagogue, and this man with an unclean spirit stands up and interrupts Jesus' sermon, and Jesus, according to the text, has authority in his teaching, and he has authority as the liberator, and he sets this man free. Well, he literally walks across the courtyard, and there is the home of Peter's mother-in-law, St. Peter. And I've got some photos that you're going to see on the screen now. It's very close to the synagogue where Jesus cast out the demon from this man. And you will see on the photos that they have done a lot of archaeological work, and it's amazing what they've done, but to preserve it, they built a new church over it as a way of protecting it. So, Jesus' first day was jam-packed. There was no idle time. He went from casting out a demon to encountering a woman who was very ill and was unable to recover. And Mark, the gospel writer, the evangelist, shows us in spades that Jesus is all in. He goes all out. He is 100% committed to proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, available here and now, right now on planet earth. He keeps it 100. So the text says, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. Now, in the first century, a fever meant much more than it does today. It means that she was near death. And they immediately told Jesus about her. And verse 31, if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to underline if you're comfortable or to take note of this. This is really important. So Jesus went to her 
took her hand and helped her up. And the fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Did you hear it? Jesus went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. And you say, okay, Jeff, I'm, I'm not quite getting it. This is a pattern for Jesus that you're going to see throughout the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus is not wasting any time. He is very busy, but he never hurries. And he is on the move as he proclaims the good news of the kingdom of God. So the text says that evening, after sunset, Mark wants us to know that Jesus wasn't working nine to five. <laughs> the people were brought to Jesus who were sick and demon-possessed. And hear this, the whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. But he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Jesus was busy, but he never hurried. And I want you to hear this pattern of Jesus' ministry that is so reflective of how the kingdom of God works now as well as then. Jesus pursued the woman. Jesus connected with the woman. Jesus helped the woman. He gave. He had to be exhausted. This was the first day. <laughs> when we talk about Jesus' public ministry being only three years, in one sense, that doesn't seem very long. But Jesus was maximizing the time because he knew his mission was to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God on earth, that it is available right here, right now, for men and women, for boys and girls, for the sick and the well, for the richer and the poor, for anybody and everybody, you could enter into the kingdom of God. And Jesus was keeping it 100. He was all in. And that's why Mark chapter 1, look at this text with me again. Very early in the morning, verse 35. While it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Now Mark wants us to know that this was an important rhythm to Jesus' life and ministry. He often would withdraw. He would come apart so he didn't come apart. And the text says that he is up really early in the morning praying. And Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they said what? Everyone's looking for you. Kind of like, Jesus, what are you doing? You're supposed to be available 24-7. Jesus was all in. But because Jesus was all in, he knew that he had to take some time in order to commune with his Abba. And Jesus replied, well, it's time to move on. Now, again, Mark wants us to know. The evangelist Mark wants us to know clearly that Jesus is 100. He's all in. He goes all out. He's all there. And Mark also wants us to know <laughs> that that's the pattern for you and that's the pattern for me. That if we want to be followers of Jesus, we begin by asking, am I all in? Am I fully surrendered? Am I willing to go all out? There's that old song, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. Forgive my singing, but I think we need another hymn. I surrender some. 
Hmm? I know in my life, sometimes I'm partially surrendered. Sometimes I'm not fully surrendered. And the beautiful gospel of Mark is saying, Jesus is all in for you. Are you all in for Jesus? And this is not about guilt. And this is not about shame. And this is not about pointing fingers and saying, oh, you should be doing this. And you should, no, 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 no. That's not the spirit in which Mark speaks. The spirit in which Mark speaks is this, that Jesus passionately pursues us. I'm going to keep saying that all through the gospel of Mark because Mark shows us Jesus never relents on pursuing us and Jesus will continue to connect with us in whatever way he can in order to help us. And the invitation of Mark is to enter into that kind of life. To enter into that kind of love. To enter into that kind of light. So verse 35 again, what did Jesus do? Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. What was he doing? He practiced silence and solitude. He was communing with his Abba. He was connecting to the Holy Spirit's power and presence and purpose in his life. Hear this, please. Silence and solitude is to the soul what gasoline is to a vehicle. And if Jesus, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and the God of Gods, has to practice solitude and silence in order to be refueled and renewed, why would it be any less true for you and for me? This was a regular rhythm in Jesus' life. And Mark is inviting us into the same rhythm, into the same practice, so that our souls might be encouraged and strengthened and renewed and refilled so that we can do what Jesus did when he was on this earth physically. So how do we do it? I'm going to get really practical. Every day, and this is not a legalism, this is not about getting brownie points with God. This is not about getting God to love us more or less. God loves us unconditionally just as we are, where we are, no matter what we do or don't do. It's not about that. But every single day, Mark is saying, I want to encourage you to practice silence and solitude. There are two sides to the same coin. If you're going to be in solitude, you need silence. If you're going to be in silence, you need solitude. And it can be done anywhere. One of the things that I like to do personally is I like to go to the Spiritual Life Center in Bel Air and the Catholic Diocese has beautiful walking trails. And there's hardly anybody out there. And now that I'm revealing this great secret, it's going to get really busy all of a sudden. But it's a good thing because I want to encourage you to try it. And I like to walk and just listen to the beauty of nature. And they've got all kinds of benches and sometimes I'll sit and I'll pray, and sometimes I'll walk, and I'll pray, and sometimes I just find myself just basking. I just sit there and take in the sun, and I not only get my vitamin D, but I get my vitamin G for God, and I commune with my Abba, and I find my spirit renewed. I find my spirit boistered. I find that I am exceedingly able to do more than I could ever imagine or think. So do you take a notebook? You can, but it's better to show up with nothing. It's better to show up without any expectation. Sometimes I go inside the Spiritual Life Center and they have a chapel that's open during business hours. It's open to anybody, no matter your faith tradition. And it's just so quiet. And the silence is almost deafening at times. And people go in there and pray. Sometimes I do that. One of the things that I've learned to do on a daily basis is that 
I get up at 5 a.m. and I spend 5 to 6 a.m. in silence and solitude. And sometimes I read scripture and sometimes I pray and sometimes I just rest in the presence of God. I said to my spiritual director several years ago, so what if I fall asleep? (laughs) This was my nun friend who's now with the Lord in heaven. She said, well, guess what? If you are intentionally spending time with Jesus and you take a nap, I think Jesus would be very pleased that you're relaxed enough to sleep in his presence. It was a beautiful reminder It's not about the do's and the don'ts. It's about showing up. So I want to encourage you to do this. And if you choose to do this, these are the benefits. You will find that your true self, meaning your true, authentic self, as God made you, will begin to emerge. And the false self, all the masks that we wear, all the pretenses that we make, all of that is just going to start evaporating away. And you will begin to see yourself as God sees you. Here's another benefit. You genuinely experience God's grace and power for the living of these days. You find that your soul is enlarged. Your soul is buoyed your soul is made more alive for the living of these days and it's not an invitation to put our heads into the sand and pretend like we're not living in difficult times no it gives us a power to actually confront all of the issues of our day here's another benefit in silence i find this to be really helpful for me in silence I give up trying to run the universe. In silence and solitude, I learn that God is very able (laughs) to run this universe. And as you hear from this pulpit often, God is in charge, but God is only in control to the extent that we allow God to be in control. But God is ultimately in charge. And if you're a parent, you know what I mean. If you're a parent of younger children, you're in charge all the time. But if you think you're in control all the time, well, take my parenting with love and logic class. So right in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City is Atlas. Atlas carrying the world on his shoulders. And you may know this story. I've never told you this part. I've shown you this picture when I went to St. Patrick's a few years back. But it's so ironic to me that here you have Atlas facing St. Patrick's Cathedral with the world on his shoulders. (laughs) And he cannot help but be looking at these incredibly large towers with crosses. It's, It's so interesting. But some of you may know this, some of you may not, that Atlas was punished by Zeus. And that's why he has to carry the weight of the world. Aren't we glad that in silence and solitude, especially, it's not the only place we come to know this, but especially in silence and solitude, we come to know that God has no desire to punish anyone for anything. That's not the God that we know in Jesus. And in silence and solitude, we come to know that the God who made the universe is very able to carry it and us. Here's another benefit that I want to share with you. Richard Foster says it better than I. The fruit of solitude is increased sensitivity and compassion for other people. There comes a new freedom to be with people. There's a new attentiveness to their needs and a new responsiveness to their hurt. Wow, I find that to be true in my life. It deepens my compassion. It deepens my sensitivity. So as I close, in the spirit of the evangelist Mark, as a follower of Jesus, are we all in? Are we at 100? Are we fully surrendered? 
the good news is <laughs> Jesus is all in for us, for you and for me. Jesus is keeping it at a hundred because we are the sheep of his pasture, the lambs of his flock. And just as Jesus brought healing to Peter's mother-in-law, the healing was in the pattern. Hear this. This is our pattern. He pursued he connected. He helped. Every single day. Why do we practice silence and solitude? It empowers us to pursue, to connect, to help those among us and around us in need of the healing touch of Jesus. We have a new member in our church, Linda. Linda sent me an email one day and said, Jeff, I have a calling to help with food. I gave her some names. It just didn't work out. I said, Linda, don't give up. She said, oh, no, no, I'm not giving up. This is a call. And I gave her the names of a couple, both of whom were diagnosed with covid one of whom ended up in the hospital very ill. The very day I called, she took food. She took a friend with her. They took food. They gather their mail. They clean up their home. I emailed her this week and said, how's it going? She said, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. See, what was she doing? She pursued them. She connected with them. And she helped them. That's the secret of a meaningful life. And that's what Jesus did. And that's what Jesus calls us to do. May it be so. Amen. In response to the word sung, read, and proclaimed, we gather at the Lord's table so that we might receive bread for the journey. So I want to invite you to get your elements of Holy Communion ready so that we might participate in the sacred meal together. I invite you to join with me in the responsive call so that we might pray this together. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks. To the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. On the night in which our Lord Jesus gave himself up for death, he took bread, he gave you thanks, he blessed it, he broke it, he shared it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat of this bread, do so in memory of me.
When the supper was ended, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He blessed it and he shared it. And he said, take and drink, each of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this cup, do so in memory of me. We ask, O oh God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on each of us gathered in many places and on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. For all glory, honor, and praise is yours, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And together we pray, as Jesus has taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, broken for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of blessing poured out for you. Thank you for joining us today for online worship. We pray that this service has been a blessing to you. If it has, would you please let me know? My email is going to appear at the bottom of the screen. So as we go forth into this new week, I hope that you will join us again next Sunday. But in the meantime, hear this good word spoken over you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit experienced in solitude and silence be yours in abundance now and forever amen go with the wind at your back in the sun on your face with a song in your heart